and we're live. Hello, everybody. My name's Tamara Woods, and this is my channel where I talk about books and writing. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the outlining drafting panel of the Evergreen Writing Oasis Retreat Day Two, baby. How you doing? Are you enjoying <laughs> yourselves? Let us know in the comments what has been like your highlight, high points of this weekend. I have to say for me, it's been talking to you guys because y'all are incredible. But without any further ado, I would love for my wonderful co-hosts to introduce themselves, starting with, oh, I pointed in the right direction, Megan. Yes. <laughs> I get it. Hi, I'm Megan Jashinsky. I vlog with the Word Nerds. Uh, we're there Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, live on Sundays. And uh, I write dark fantasy and horror, and I'm gonna be querying forever probably. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, have loved the panels today. I still have to get caught up on the ones from yesterday, but it's been really great. I'm really excited to be here. Yay. And then, Hello. Okay, so I'm Brooke. My uh, YouTube channel is called By the Brook, and I like to do writing life type videos and also writing sprints as well, which I love doing all that sorts of stuff. And I am trying to currently write a fantasy book that is also a series that I will hopefully eventually self-publish soon and stuff. So yeah, I am so excited about this today, especially since I do believe the writing community here on YouTube is probably the absolute best community on YouTube. It's truly yeah. is like everyone is <laughs> welcoming. <laughs> Yay! Happy to be here. <laughs> Oh, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel. I am another word nerd with Megan. Yes, I pointed in the right corner. Okay. <laughs> We're killing it already. Yes. Yeah, all right. It's going to be a good day. Um, yes, I'm one of the word nerds. And then I have my own uh, booktube channel and blog under a model who's red, which is R-E-A-D. Uh, and I am a book blogger and writer from Vancouver, Canada. She has the prettiest Instagrams of all time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I try. Not from Canada. <laughs> Yes, yeah. surprise. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Well, everybody, my name is Michael Laron. I am a self published author of over 50 books of science fiction and fantasy. I've kind of written a lot of across the spectrum of science fiction and fantasy. I've also written some self help books for writers, and I run the YouTube channel Author Level Up, and I produce videos every Friday. And my main goal is to help writers master the craft of writing and create books that they're going to be proud of. And so, um, yeah, I've got a, a great community and I, I'm really excited to be here to talk about this. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And again, your voice is like smooth jazz. So this is gonna be amazing. <laughs> this is gonna be absolutely incredible. So everyone in the comments, I would greet you all, but I feel like I will get overwhelmed and we don't want that. So I'm just gonna tell you hello and thank you for being here. We appreciate you so very much. And what we're going to do is we have five questions that we're going to go through. And then afterwards, we're going to field as many questions from y'all as possible. And um, hopefully my wrench crew is here. Holy guacamole. I wasn't even thinking about super stickers. Thank you, Bonnie. I really appreciate your support. Awesome. Thank you so much. As always, you, you never have to do the super sticker or super chat or anything like that. But if you do, it's amazing. And thank you. Um, was there any... Miss Barbara, you are like really heavy lifting my like entire author career. Like... She comes through every single time with this support and I appreciate you and thank you. Let me see. I like how her avatar is like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, it is a cool her avatar. avatar is the best. Like every time she changes something. So when she's editing, there's like an editing avatar that goes along with it. I mean, she's like, she's the bee's knees. I love her. <laughs> she also has a book coming out next month, but. Yes. She doesn't want us to talk about it. It's yet, exciting. So, so I'm not talking about it. I'm not talking about it. Just mention it real quick. All right. So do you have a preferred outlining method? What do you, how do you like to outline? Are you cards? Are you, do you have like the crazy 
Pinterest board on your wall with like yarn <laughs> and push pins? How did it work for you? I had a mini existential crisis when you sent that question. Cause I was like, oh no, we <laughs> 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 didn't know anything about this. Oh no. No. Well, I've I seen your videos. You do like the the panels and the little cards and the sticky yeah. notes and moving stuff around. Yeah, I do that a lot for revisions. In like the mm. pre-writing, it kind of changes for every book. But there are a few things that I like to know. Like I like to know some character things. And then I like to know roughly where I want them to end up. And then a midpoint. And I kind of discovery write to the midpoint. And then I have to plot everything out from there. <laughs> So you can make it make sense. Connect yeah, like get to know them out. and then clean it up. That's really interesting. <laughs> Going, discovering up, up until the midpoint and then outlining. That's that's pretty cool. I've never heard anyone say that. <laughs> it's a nice in between of pantsing and plotting. Yeah, I do yeah. enjoy that. That is cool, especially that way. Um, because I feel like sometimes the ending is really hard to nail down whenever you don't know the beginning. So that mm -hmm. way you are able to kind of put all the pieces together after you've gotten the ground wet and stuff. So. Yeah. And I love a midpoint twist or like a big reveal. Like that's something you can expect in any book you read from me in the future. Like something's gonna happen at the midpoint. And so I love having that thing to work to. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I can go next. Um, you know, I, I might be the contrarian here, but I actually don't outline my novels anymore. <gasps> um, I, I used to. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually used to. I did. I outlined my novels for probably the first five to seven, and then I realized as I was outlining that I was deviating from my outline every time. So, like, I would outline, and then I would get in the middle of the manuscript, and then I would, oh, oh my character's taking me over here, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do what I wrote down. Mm -hmm. and I realized if I'm gonna do that, why am I spending this time outlining? So, it, I'm kind of unique in that I can. I, I've done both. So I. I I, I'm primarily a discovery writer now, so I, I write into the dark. That's a term coined by Dean Wesley Smith. Um, but when I did outline, I just kind of, I kept it simple. I used um, just very simple uh, text documents in Scrivener. And I just kind of wrote down scene one, here's what the character wanted, scene two, uh, motivation, goal, conflict. I kind of like that. If you've been, if anybody's heard of the goal, motivation, conflict. I use that, but I tried to keep it as simple as possible because I found that I could get sucked into it in a really big way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah like a, a really, it was, it was a problem. Procrasta plotting. Procrasta plotting. I love that term. <laughs> that is a great term. Um, yeah, we read GNC um, for Writer's Workshop last year, and I'm not a big plotter, but I found that book to be really helpful in terms of getting me to look at my book and my manuscript at the time in like a different way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great read if anyone is interested. Um, anyone else on the panel like to take a swing? Well, um, I am someone who never likes to outline with anything I have to physically write down. It's all going to be technology outlining. So I do everything on my Google Docs and also kind of a little bit, not so much for outlining, but also for story Bible wise, I'll story Bible as I'm also outlining kind of if I need to here and there. Um, but I'll do uh, story Bible stuff on campfire, but everything is typically on Google Docs. Um, and I do it where it's just like lots of bullet points. And whenever I outline, I'm also kind of zero drafting as well, where it's like I'll outline like lots of the quick beat stuff. But then if I have an idea of what I want to put in the book at that point that I'm writing uh, for the outline, then I'll just kind of do like the indent of the second bullet, if that makes sense, like the little indent bullet thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll start putting dialogue that I'm like, oh, I know I want to say this for this character here, or I know I want this description to be here. So it's kind of like I'm kind of writing as I'm outlining. I kind of do a little bit of both. So that's why my outlines sometimes take a long time. But um, that's usually the type of process I go with is zero drafting, uh, not zero drafting, uh, zero, yeah, zero drafting-ish while outlining, but more so outlining overall. Mm -hmm. 
That's yeah. so smart. I have like a huge list usually that I keep that I just put flashes for this idea and I'll just like word vomit it all out. But like, I should probably organize it into the order I want those things to happen and I would have less of a hard time later. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like in the middle of, I'll, I'll usually write a scene because that's usually how I get my ideas is I have a scene or I have like a, an interaction. And then I just have this random interaction and then I kind of have to like outline around it of like, okay, where is this in the story? And then how will we get here? How are we going from here? So it's usually a little bit of chaos and it ends up just being one very long word document of <laughs> this idea, oh, this plot line, oh, they can say this thing. And then I have all these like random chunks and kind of have to copy paste and move stuff around before I have anything resembling yeah. an outline. <laughs> And I'm sure for any for any person who's outlining where it's not going to make sense to anyone else who would like pick it up and look through it, they're going to be like, what is this nonsense? But mm -hmm. to you, you know your own system and you know how yep. your mind works and how you like made your points across or whatever. So it will make sense to you and that's all it needs to make sense to is yourself. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of like your room. If, if your room is messy, it doesn't matter if it's messy. It only matters if you know how to find where the stuff is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Why yeah. don't people understand this concept? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the desk is messy and I can't find things. Now it's when I can't find the things that's when I have to clean it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess that's the same with uh, my drafts. So when I'm drafting things, I kind of think of myself as a plotster at this point. Um, I do a little bit of plotting, but it's it's the bare, bare minimum because I find that if I plot too much, then I I lose the drive to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So I have so it's like a very fine line for me to kind of balance. So I'll plot maybe like some basic beats um, and I don't plan for who the murderer is. Ooh, so, okay. I think I wanted to ask about your uh, your cozy mystery series, the beach one. I was like, did you plan the murder? No. I wanted to know. I I, fi I figure out the murderer, and then I go back and drop the hints if I haven't already dropped them. But it's sometimes it it's like my subconscious is like, no, girl. This is what you need to do. You'll figure this out. <laughs> You'll figure this out in a couple yeah. weeks. This is where we're at it. And, and that's like a, a happy accident. Yes. Let's check out the also, comments. Uh, that book is really good. Highly recommend. It's Wiped Out, Murder is a Beach by Tamara Woods. <laughs> <laughs> Megan is our resident hype beast. Like, <laughs> constantly <laughs> shouting out everyone else. Do not invite me to your channel. I will hype your book. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am a little embarrassed, and that is great. So, so there, everyone's sharing some um, ways that they do their outlining, and I just wanted to share some. So, Snowflake with notes sprinkled pretty much everywhere. I definitely am a person who has notes everywhere. Mm -hmm. It would be such a mess if anyone would look at my zero draft. Oh my gosh. Car, uh, index boards and whiteboard. On my whiteboard, I literally have notes. And they're notes that occur to me at some point in the writing process. And then as I get to that point, I'm like, okay, so um, so-and-so needs to do this fan snap. All right, that's happened. Let me erase it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like oh, little okay. things that are that aren't necessarily like big items, but just little I things. And here's Caro, I do a bare base outline and then go, have to go back and adjust it mm -hmm. because the story has fleshed out on its own. Stevie does a combo. That way, otherwise I end up starting over when the characters go off script. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's a huge part of why I stopped trying to plot my beginnings because it was making it so like I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't go off script. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the way you do it, Megan, because there, there's something that you said to Mara earlier. You said that if you plot too much, you know what's going to happen and you kind of lose interest in the story. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that you do it in the beginning, Megan, because then mm -hmm. that way it feels like you, you're you kind of playing around with everything. And then once you start getting to the end of the story, you kind of know what's going to happen anyway, even if you are a discovery mm -hmm. writer. And so it's kind of like the best of best of both worlds. Yeah. And Barbara is married to the KM Wyland outline template in Scrivener. And I have, 
I, I do have that one. It's so funny that I have all these like outlining templates and I use none of them, but I have them. <laughs> you try all of them, just one yeah. and see. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important the, for people to recognize that you, your writing can fluctuate and it can change and you're allowed to experiment. In fact, I think that all of us here on this panel have probably experimented many different times with our writing styles and how we do things. And that from there, you're able to adjust it and make it fit you. Yeah, no one's gonna come to your house and shoot you because <laughs> you tried some unique hybrid of, of a writing model. There, there's no right or wrong way. Sometimes people can really try to get prescriptive about outlining in particular. and. Mm -hmm. There's just no, mm -hmm. do what works for you. If you're an outliner, cool. If you're a pantser, cool. If you're a mix between both, cool. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's it's about what makes you most efficient and gives you a story that you're happy about. Yeah, yeah I remember I when I first started great. writing, it was all of those things of like, okay, this is how you do it. And this is exactly, if you want to do it this way, you got to do it this way. And then it would stress me out. And then I wouldn't write it at all because I was like, this is too difficult. I'm just going to close everything down. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's... And that's unfortunate. And yeah. I hope that anyone who's in the comments, don't let people's advice hold you back. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes too much advice is really is too much advice. Take everything we say with a grain of salt. We are not mm -hmm. the yeah. one and true experts, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's also like so many really famous authors do those workshops or say like, oh, this is my outlining process. And you're like, wow, this is so cool. But then you kind of have that thing of like, well, they did it and they sold a ton of books, so I should do it this way, and then I'll sell a yeah. ton of books. But like, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. No matter how hard like you want to be like that one author, sometimes it's just not not the process for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And before we move on to the next question, I did want to ask uh, you guys here or anyone in the comments: Do you do the same process for each book, or is every book just totally different whenever you are plotting and getting the story together? Because I know that there are some people who are like, that, that is their routine, they're used to it. And there's some people where it's like every new book, like a completely new experience. And mm -hmm. so I'm kind of, I haven't really experienced um, the sameness <laughs> for each book. Everything is always different for me usually. Hmm. Yeah, I can take a stab at that. Um, when I, when, <laughs> for, the, for the novels. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the novels that I outlined, I can answer it with that. So my very first novels were interactive, like choose your own adventure style stories for adults. So like you you can't not outline those books. Um, and so I had I found myself doing a lot of like decision trees and like stuff like that. But then when I switched to like traditional, you know, read it from front to back cover, I found that I just experimented with everything. I, so it feels like every novel is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Like what I wrote, I wrote a series of androids and I felt like I had to do a lot of outlining on the timeline so that I knew what the timeline was leading up to the year 2300. And I felt like I spent a lot of time in like futurism and things like that. But then when I wrote a fantasy series of dragons, I didn't really have to do that. So it's like, you almost have to change. It's, it's almost like improvisation. Like with jazz, you change your, change your style to suit the story itself. That's just my, that's kind of how I handle it. Yeah, for sure. That makes me think of, I have two projects that I'm kind of working on right now. And one, it was very like, didn't plot till the midpoint, got to the midpoint, reread everything. And it was like, okay, I need to plot now and figured it out. And then the other one that I'm working on, there's like a, a premonitions component to it where like someone's going to be making a lot of premonitions. And then in the second half of the book, it's gonna be like, oh, we didn't really think any of these things were gonna come true, but they're all coming true. And so that it needed a little bit more structure. Like I needed to know where are these gonna be said and at what point are they gonna come true? And so I like pinpointed all of those, which is more plotting than I would normally do for the beginning. Rachel, uh, do you tend to change your style from book to book or? Um, honestly, no, not really. It kind of just depends on how much comes to me at what points. Cause, because sometimes I have stories that I'm like, oh, I have the entire ending of this. And then sometimes I'm like, I have one sentence and we'll have to work around that. So it kind of just it depends on like how much of the story I already know before I start writing. But for the most part, like I said earlier, it's just kind of like, I have to, I have one idea and then I build around it. 
So sometimes I'm just building for longer. That's sort of it though. That made me think of like a mind map. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I know I kind of went like this, but it's, I don't know, I guess it's like this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind I, um, of what the snowflake structure is a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Hey, you just kind of build everything out. I was curious yeah. to get Earl's perspective. What do you do with your outlines when you're done with your novel? Do you go back, like if there's anything that's different, do you go back and, and update it or do you just kind of throw it aside? Or do I you use it for the mine. next one? I update mine. Um, and when you said when you're done with your novel, are you meaning like full completion or like after like the first draft or the second draft or something? Like, like when you're done, like when you are ready to publish the book and okay. you're, you no longer technically need it unless you have a specific reason for it. I'll let you guys go because I, whenever I had self-published my book years ago, I did not outline. So I haven't actually, I guess, come to this stage then. So I'll, or I'll let you guys go. <laughs> I, I tend to outline at the end of the book so that mm -hmm. because my draft is so very messy, I need to make sure that I have hit all the points and things make sense and there's an actual cohesion to the story and it's not just me like spitting out ideas and things and it doesn't quite work and to make sure that I've given enough hints and mm -hmm. that there's the, the red herring exists, you know, or mm -hmm. that I didn't like give you a red herring in act one and then forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Which I do all the time. Right? <laughs> Yeah, so, feel like reading drafts, that. being like, "Oh, this guy, I completely forgot about him." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, where did John go? Oh, man. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I forgot about you. Mystery. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's what I tend to do, and then by the time I've done that, I just I kind of keep it on the side so that um, because I'm starting to write series now, so I keep it in. I'm trying to create a series Bible. Um, I'm not very uh, good at that. I have been very slack with it, but <laughs> the outline is there to like help me when I actually uh, put a little effort into creating it. <laughs> yeah, I do something really similar where I'll like, I keep the old one, uh, but then I'll just rewrite it when it comes time like to revise that first draft. Cause I like to look and see like, well, what did I intend and what happened? And like, what things did I intend to have happen that don't need to versus like, oh, well I should try and fix this in revisions. And then I also just like having the little paper trail so I can look back at like, oh, the baby book, like what it became. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's- update my, my outline as I go, because again, usually I'm using like an online or digital format of like note taking and, and scene breakdown. So I usually update it as I'm writing. Like I'll leave notes for myself to be like, oh, make sure to add in this thing here. Or, hey, remember John from that like first whole, you know, few chapters. But for the most part, when, I, when I'm done, it's just a whole new outline. So if I remember something of like, oh, I remember that this character used to be named this, I'll kind of like write it down as like a little fun fact for myself. But it tends to be so different that I've also never written a series, so that might also have something to do with it, that maybe if I was writing a series, I would keep it um, in case, you know, I was planning, originally planning something else. Yeah, that's 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 kind of how I do it. I, mm -hmm. I Since I'm right into the dark now, I outline as I go. So af oh. after I finish a scene, I will actually create an outline and I'll write down what happened. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go to the next chapter and then write down what happened and then when I'm done with the book, because I, I tend to do all my stuff in one draft now, I have an outline that's 100% up to date. And then I usually can't remember what I write in my story. So I actually go back to the outline and use that as, okay, that's what happened. And then I can use that for book two. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting to hear, hear oh how goodness. everyone does it. I love I that idea. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I might have to steal that. <laughs> yeah. like, that resonated with me. <laughs> It, it, it's a game changer like, for me. <laughs> yeah, because because then because then you build it as you go, so it's always a hundred percent right. Like you don't have to worry about updating it. But that requires a little bit of planting. Depends on your <laughs> with that. Mine is <laughs> one. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that's a good way of still keeping structure and still outlining without outlining at the exactly. same time. It's a cool way of doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. Let's and I'm, see. 
So Sky says for series, I like to keep the outlines and update them so I can keep them for tracking events for future books. For standalones, I haven't really kept them. And let's see what some other folks had to say. I always save my unedited outlines to prove prog process in case of copyright problems. Mm. Interesting. That's, that's a very astute mm. point. Yeah, that, yeah. that's um, yeah, that, very wise. Especially, uh, yeah, copyright infringement. There's always, uh, always those questions. Mm -hmm. That's why I always like to email myself uh, all of my stuff. <laughs> a lot of the time, I'm like, "Aha! This was back years ago." Yeah. Like, I see, I've been working on this for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I hope no one ever actually asks to see those emails because it's like, here is your garbage book again, and it's still <laughs> not good. <laughs> Things we tell ourselves, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should be nicer to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday we were discussing no negative self-talk. We're supposed to try to stop doing that. Yes, yes. no negative self-talk oh. 2020. Oh, but I it's love self-deprecating jokes is the problem. <laughs> I do too. It's a real problem. Um, Izzy, there's a Neil uh, Gaiman quote where he says, I thought I learned how to write a book. And then I told Stephen King, he laughed at me and said, no, you learned how to write that story. Mm. Wow, I feel I'm that. Okay, man. And, um, I, I, don't, I know it's worse. I don't know it's worse. Like to have that, have that quote be true, or to be like slapped by Stephen King. Like, I know. Uh, <laughs> just decay. Just like yeah. turn into dirt. <laughs> just like no. <laughs> so stuck at that Stephen King always like says like that he still feels like a noob after all of his works and after yeah. all this time, I'm like, oh my gosh, that just makes me feel so insignificant. What does he say? <laughs> So like, would you rather he be like, oh, I got this. Like, there's nothing left for me to learn. Like, so. <laughs> Amazing. Oh my gosh, I need one of those. <laughs> it was a gift from Caro. Well, Michael, oh, very do you nice. still feel like a noob after oh, yeah. 50 books? You do? Yeah, oh, I mean, I, I feel like I've learned a lot over the last seven years. And, um, you know, I, I've I really take the time to learn craft and continue to get better with every book that I write, but I still feel like there's a lot of things that I could learn. And there's so much that like, if you look at like the Stephen Kings and the Neil Gaiman's and the Nora Roberts and Michael Crichton's and John Grisham's of the world, I mean, they're, they're executing on a level that is just so high that it's, it's like such a great thing to shoot for. So I don't know that I'll ever feel like I'm there. Um, but I, for me, it's just always about the journey. As, as long as I'm learning something and having fun with what I'm writing, it's all good. Learning something and having fun. Goals. <laughs> Those are goals. Those are my career goals. What can I learn and how can I have fun? And that's how, how I build my writing business. So. Yay. Those are some good words to live by. Right? Hmm. Have we touched on this now? What does your drafting process look like? I think we kind of did a little bit yeah yeah a little bit like adjacent so let's go to this one then how do you know when a draft is done i feel like this is a question that always comes up especially with people who are still trying to figure out their process i i thought a lot about this one before our call and from it, it, it i Okay, so to, to me, to answer this question, I think you almost have to sidestep a little bit. And it's not knowing when the draft is done, it's being confident enough to be able to move forward. Like mm -hmm. I think so much of writing, with, especially with pantsing, but also with plotting, I think so much of it is just eliminating fear from your life. You know, I mean, we all, we all have this inner fear that we're not good enough or that the book is not good enough and so it needs an extra round of editing. And I think if you can, get eliminate that fear and focus on that confidence piece especially if if you're a newer writer i think then you, you're never going to feel like it's done right but you you can at least feel like it's good enough to take that next step and mm. what the picture of good enough is you don't know when you write your first novel or your first two or three but you start to get a sense of it once you've got a few books under your belt but i'd be curious to, to know what everybody else thinks about that I feel like I needed to digest that for a minute. Like, yeah, good enough. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfectionism is, is, it's a problem. You know, sure. it's easy, it's easy mm-hmm. to do. And, and that, that holds you back more than, than it lets you move forward because you're never, your book is never going to like, there could be problems in your book that you like, for example, if you're writing chapter four and a cyborg comes into the, to the scene and you're worried about readers not understanding how cool the cyborg is. Right. And you think that that's a problem. Your readers might not think that that's a problem. Your readers might not even, they might think this character's awesome. I love this. I love the cyborg, but you don't see that because you're too close to your own work to really know. And in some cases you don't know until you publish the book, what readers are going to like or what they don't like. They may not care about chapter four. They may rip apart chapter 11, which you thought was great. You know, you just don't, mm-hmm. you just don't know. Yeah, for sure. I know for me, my my outlining and drafting process changes a lot, but the figuring out if it's done process is pretty set for me because I do have this constant like, oh, well, what if it's not good enough? What if I I send it out now and it's it's not ready and so it doesn't get an agent or whatever and it's all my fault because I put it out too fast and it was pretty debilitating to the point where I had to just set up like, okay, these are the steps. And if you do these steps, then it's ready. So I do a first draft. I do a big round of revisions on that draft. I send it to beta readers. I revise again. I have one evaluation period of like, depending on how big the post beta readers revisions were, maybe I send it out to someone else for more feedback. Um, But like once that's done, it's good. We send it out, we see. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of courage <laughs> to be able to draw a line in the sand like that. Cause I know a lot of people that will work on a draft for 15, 20 drafts before they feel like it's done, you know, and right. being able to just draw that line. That's really cool. Cause you really can just do it forever and just be like, well, I could make it better. And it just, how much better you can make it. It gets smaller and smaller with every draft yeah. you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's sure. I think for me, I find that, my like when I'm done, it's when I've said everything that I want to say. And so sometimes that can take a really long time. Sometimes I need to edit it a couple of times to like get it out. But for the most part, like when I finish a draft and however many revisions it takes, what have you, when I'm like, yes, this is what I wanted to happen. This is the point I wanted to make and anything smaller or finickier I can, I can, you know, do based on feedback what have you but like when i have everything out that i'm like this is what i wanted to say we're done and then, so that's kind of keeps me from being like let's do 15 epilogues <laughs> <laughs> just like lord of the rings and yeah yeah, yeah. like i don't have to keep going down. it's fine it's fine yeah i will say that the last time that i had finished a first draft of mine um i had originally int- uh, intended for the end of that first draft to be the middle a point of the book and it was supposed to be a lot longer. And then whenever I was looking at this book going, God, this thing is so long. And I was like, honestly, this would be a good uh, stopping point to a book. And I was kind of kidding around in my head and I was like, (laughs) 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 look at how it was uh, like, uh, cause if you read uh, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, they go over the beats, you know, that you want to try and go for. I don't know how you all feel about Save the Cat, but um, I had a lot of the similar beats that I had needed to hit. And then I also felt like, well, my character right now, he has gone through a really good arc and had ended in this midpoint that I thought was a midpoint. She had ended in a place of where I was like, this could be a book right here. So I had kind of just like gone, okay, well, I'll have to tweak some things, but I, it was the confidence. It was just kind of like I felt right and I felt settled. And it was, just kinda, I don't know, there, it's just kind of like that, when you know, you know type thing, yeah. I guess, to where I was just like, yeah, this is where this needs to stop for a book one's journey type thing. And I knew I had to make some adjustments because um, I needed to just have it to where it was more of the, oh, what's the thing after the climax? I can't Falling remember. action? Oh. Yes, yeah, falling action, thank you. Um, I knew I needed to kind of like have kind of a nice like uh, soft ending rather than more cliffhanging ending and stuff like that. And then once I found that, I was like, yeah, this is a great first draft right here that obviously needs work. But I just felt very confident with that story and stuff. So yeah, I'll say sometimes when you know, you know, whenever that draft is done. 
and stuff. But yeah, yeah. That's just like falling in love or I know. yeah, <laughs> finding a pet at the pet store. <laughs> Okay, I'm falling in love. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know. I think with me, um, I probably go more along the lines of, um, hey, betas, alpha readers, critique partners, help me. And then also, okay, I think, I think we're here now. <laughs> I think we've done it now. And I think that I can send this on to my editor, but I'm still at the point where I do developmental edits because I'm still learning how to write a better draft and to make sure that I'm like doing all the things that I need to do. So that's also part of my process. Yeah, yeah I'm still definitely learning. And uh, that's why I feel like I'm like going back to first draft conversation while you guys are like going, oh, after all of my books, I'm like, oh my <laughs> you, you, you'll, you'll get there sooner than you think. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely still um definitely learning and growing, which I will be for all time after this and stuff uh from this point. But yeah, um I just feel like you guys have very good wise words to share with your guys' pieces. I feel like we have a nice range of experience yeah. here, and that's good. Yeah. So Alina, she hosted the fast drafting panel or workshop that just happened before this one. And she said minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. She was agreeing with Michael. It's a really great concept to try to stick to. Otherwise, no draft would ever be done. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely I right. saw that and I was like, yes, y'all need to see that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, let's see. We've, we've I was, no, no, please, whatever you're going to say, I'm just looking oh. for <laughs> I was going to say, we've talked a lot about like, oh, well, it just feels done, you know, and that can be a bit of a difficult thing to hone because like you might be hearing that and maybe you're earlier on in your, your writing journey and you're like, I, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and I think that's something that you can definitely hone more, like the more you read stories, the more you look at them from a writer's eye, you can be like, oh, well, like, why did they choose to end this here, do I think? And then I think studying all the different kinds of plotting structures, you know, look at three act, look at four act, read things like Save the Cat. And I, I used to stick pretty rigidly to those plots um, in the first few books that I wrote, not because I couldn't like go off and do whatever I wanted, but because I was learning, well, what does a classic story structure look like? Mm -hmm. And kind of figuring out, okay, well, how can I play within this? I need to know what it is before I can play with it. So, um, that's such a great point, especially reading. Like that is probably the most important thing you can do is just continue reading books that you like. Like I, I learned to not read books. If, if I'm reading a book and I don't like it, then I don't read it anymore because I can't really learn from that. But if I'm reading a book that's just like spellbound, like I'm spellbound the whole time reading it, like what did that author do to, to make me spellbound? Because you can learn so much from that and then you start to internalize it. And then you don't think about it, but when you start writing, that stuff starts seeping into your work. So especially like I, I recommend that pantsers read a lot um, because if you're a pantser, you almost have to read more because you're going to, that's all you're going to be able to rely on when you're writing your story. But outlining is also important too and understanding the theory and you know, kind of how all the Legos snap together. Mm -hmm. Reread your faves for sure. Mm -hmm. yep. Deadlines, yes, I live on deadline. All right, how do y'all feel about deadlines? Uh, <laughs> it, it depends. You know, I, I've had, I've had, I've had times where I hit deadlines. I've had times where they've just kind of blown by, <laughs> and it, it all depends on what's going on in my life. You know, like, like I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, I try to write as much as I can. But just circumstances happen. Like it's one thing if you're a full-time writer and this is all you're doing. Yeah, it's probably, you can probably meet those deadlines, but like I've got a six-year-old daughter, I got a puppy, got a rabbit, you know, I'm in law school. Like it's just, it's just so many things that just happen. That you just can't, <laughs> you know, and I have a, I have a full-time job too. And like, I try not to beat myself up if I don't hit my deadlines, but at the same time, it is important to have them because you can really, kind of spiral out of control if you're not careful. Oh, man. Just it's a side note. All of that. 
<laughs> yes, that's what I was gonna. Uh, you know, a side note: Do you have a video about how you manage your time on I your do. channel? Hell. I do. So, I can link anyone, to it. Yes, if anyone else was just like, "How did you do this?" <laughs> yeah, very carefully. I, I don't. I, I don't. How much? Uh, how much sanity I have left? But <laughs> <laughs> do you like sleep? Yeah, I sleep. I try. <laughs> I try. Although at some point I'm going to get those uh, robotic implants where you don't. Have to <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! The sci-fi well, is cyborgs. I think he's trying to be an author cyborg who's also taking like lawyer uh, lawyer school. Who's also going to law school, and then yeah, you have yeah. kids. Oh, he'll be unstoppable. Lawyer <laughs> <laughs> school cyborg. I was like, oh. lawyer, and then I was like, no. That it's, sounds like uh, a book all to itself. It could be a really. It could be a really interesting. Somebody steal that plot. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Of Sky, me too. I love dead I love watching them as they fly by. Like, <laughs> I try to uh, adhere to deadlines, but um, yes, sometimes that does not actually happen. But I am fortunate enough that I am able to kind of, I'm, I've, I'm cr trying to kind of create a circumstance for myself that allows for that kind of flexibility because I know me and I've been with me for a very long time. And I know that a firm deadline does not work in my world. It's just something always comes up and it's like a hundred things. So I have to have that flexibility. Yeah. I, I I love a good deadline. I'm not in a position in my writing career where I get a ton of really hard deadlines. So it is a lot of like, oh, well, I know I can do it if I try by this date. So let's do it by this date. But I, I am really big on goal setting. And like, if I hit the deadline, then I get to go to Taco Bell or something. <laughs> like, there you go. Just winning all around. <laughs> You got to give yourself something, something to work for. Exactly. Right? It's small victories, you know. <laughs> like what I like to do when I publish a book, I always like to play Queen. We are the champion. Yeah. We are the champions. Yeah. Like I just look forward to that. Like the book gets published, I just sing the song. You know, just like the little that. things. You got to, got to celebrate. Mm -hmm. You do. You have to celebrate. I like to have a nice wine. Um, I'll I'll buy a bottle at the beginning of the process, and then when I'm finally hitting publish. That's when I crack it open. Oh. I'm like, yes, I did it. <laughs> Let me sip the the grapes. The wine of champions. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it feels really good. And of course, you know, drink responsibly. Um, and if you're underage, don't drink at all. And yeah. I also enjoy ginger ale. So <laughs> everyone drinks some water right now. Right? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Stay yeah. hydrated. All They're gonna be in the comments all day. Like, stay hydrated. Stay, stay hydrated. Fun. Don't be thirsty, my friends. Stay hydrated. No. <laughs> Let's see. So what's the next question? Do you have any tips to help the discovery writers to focus their process? How can we focus? Yeah, I, if you're interested in discovery writing, I think the, the key book on it is Writing Into the Dark by Dean Wesley Smith. Um, that book completely changed the way that I write. I mean, and it's basically how to write a novel without an outline. Although he, you do outline, like, like I mentioned, um, but it's not outlining in the true sense of the term. Uh, that would be a great, resource for people to check out. It's it's not for everybody. It's one of those things where sometimes when you come across stuff, maybe you're not ready for it. Some people may not be ready for it or it may not be some people's cup of tea, but I think it's a fantastic book. Um, I don't know if I can plug my own stuff, but I have also written a book on this for Pantsers um, called Beat a Writing Machine and people could check that out as well. It's kind of manifesto on how to beat writer's block and be prolific, so. What was it called? Be a writing machine. Yep, um, I can put a, I can get a link to it too if you want. Absolutely. Yep. I am not against some uh, healthy self promo. I'm not okay. against. I always it. like to ask. You know, sometimes. I mean, I, let's see. I'm also internally laughing a little bit because I love how this is like an outlining stream. And he's like, "Here's a book that helps you not outline." <laughs> 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 it's a <trend. laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I'm a contrarian. <laughs> I'm oddball sometimes in the way I approach things, but um, and I'm all too. Really 
I have writing into the dark, actually. That is on my TBR and it's on my nightstand. But that's why I created Writer's Workshop, where we read a nonfiction writing book each month because I have a lot of books mm -hmm. on my TBR that I absolutely do not get to. <laughs> I'm horrible at like physically reading nonfiction books, but I love listening to books on Audible or just audio mm -hmm. that are uh, creative writing type craft books. My next one I'm wanting to get is Story Genius. I'm wanting to get that one next. My next oh, Friday is August, so I'm like patient. I'm impatiently waiting for that one. <laughs> I've heard I've heard good things about that one. I haven't I haven't read it, but I've I've heard it talked about in a lot of circles. What are your guys' favorite? craft books. I would say that mine, uh, sorry if I'm going off detail, um, I'd say that mine no, no. can't write a novel and then creating story arcs by KM. Is it Wayland or Wyland? I never it's know. Wyland. Wyland. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love that book. That one's probably my favorite uh, writing book. It just is really, really helpful. I'm trying to grab books. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, that's a tough question. I can't see it's like asking writers what their favorite books are. Oh, goodness. Let's see. Um, um, hmm. What is my favorite writing book? I really enjoyed reading GMC last year. Um, so you had mentioned that before. I don't remember if I can recall what that is. Um, Goal, Motivation, Conflict by okay. Deborah Dixon. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. And if yes. I'm wrong, someone tell me. Nope, you um, got it. All right. Excellent. <laughs> But um, I really like the way she broke things down for me. And I I hadn't thought about um, characters in that way. Like for instance, that each character needs to have its own agency and has needs to have some type of goal and motivation and conflict mm -hmm. that um, moves them through the story. Oh, yes. James Scott Bell writes a lot of really excellent craft books. Yeah, he's great. Uh, I, 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 re I read everything he publishes. He's, mm -hmm. he's great. It's so very, so very, very helpful. Um, Kara and I joke that <laughs> we're like, um, we can't keep going back to the same, to James Scott Bell for Writer's Workshop for like every single book. Like we're not his fan club. <laughs> We've got to expand. <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of people though, when they started becoming writers, they read his books. I mean, cause he, he wrote with writer's digest for a while. And like, I think he, he's, he's had a big hand in helping a lot of developing writers. It's really, he deserves more kudos for sure. All right. I have my favorite. Uh, it's called, and this is kind of an obscure book, but it's called creating story people mm -hmm. uh, by Dwight V. Swain. Actually, I think that's the name. Yeah. Creating characters. I'm sorry. Creating characters how to build story people. And it's it's super nuts and boltsy, like line by line, what you should consider writing with your characters and how to flesh out characters and how to make them more convincing, how to make them more real. And one of the things that in that book that just completely changed my perspective on characters was to think about characters like real people. So instead of thinking about them like characters imagine that readers are going to see the character as a real person, but there's different ways to, to think about it. Like you, thinking about psychology, thinking about like that, that was the first book I ever read where it actually tapped into human psychology and, and married that to character theory, which I thought was just a complete game changer. Um, he's, he, wrote, he wrote another book. I think that more people probably have heard of it's called techniques of the selling writer which is not, it's not a bad book, but I like this one a lot better. <clears throat> um, I have like a, a bit of an addiction to buying um, writing craft books. So feed my addiction, give me more suggestions. <laughs> I, say, like, I, I think I'm probably the least experienced of people here. Um, I'm not like, I haven't published anything, uh, anything fiction, but I don't, so I don't really read a lot of, craft books but i do listen to a lot of craft podcasts ah, so stuff cool. like that is i mean the, the classics are you know 88 cups of tea um uh the bestseller experiment um 
One, oh God, I can, now I'm on the spot. I can't think of any right now. <laughs> uh, you, you can Google plenty. There's tons. Uh, hey, YA is a is more of like a book. Um, oh, a, oh, a cat. Hello. Hey. Oh, we have a surprise guest. Come say oh, hello. Cool. Did anyone just get bingo? Because there's an animal on the screen. Hello. <laughs> this is Pumpkin. She hates everybody, including me. So I'm very surprised that she's here. Hi, honey. You gonna come join us? Oh, thank you. Okay. We have a mascot for today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but and even kind of just some random, uh, random podcasts that have authors on. Um, so it'll be like, oh, I see. For example, I love the Schwab. So like, oh, I see the Schwab is going to be on this podcast talking about books, and so I'll kind of just do that and like cherry pick some people uh, to go listen to. Maggie Steve Otter is amazing and great, and she she just had um like a virtual uh, writing retreat, didn't she? Just recently. It's a an online like workshop. That you yes, thank you. To, yeah. Yes, so she just did that. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, we had a request to repeat yeah. the podcast. You said please. Oh yes. Um, so one of them is eighty eight cups of tea. One of them is the bestseller experiment. That's one that I do. Um, and oh man, what is that other one? To Google this now because. <laughs> I really like first draft with Sarah Any. Um, okay. Good one. What's KM uh, Ryland's podcast name? I always forget that one. But I yeah, do she did have a podcast. Did she? Does she still do it? I I don't remember if she still does it or not. I haven't listened to it in a long time. She did it for a long time. It's called like Writers Helping Writers or something. Yeah, yeah, that's it's the name of her site. Writing writers, that's what it is. I did. She was like the OG well. of writing craft podcasts. Mm -hmm. I mean, she did them da like daily for a while since like 2012. Mm -hmm. I tend to skew more for um, like self-publishing podcasts, like the Creative Pen at thecreativepen.com. <laughs> <laughs> Pen with a double end. That's my terrible, terrible, terrible British accent. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to anyone. Um, and um, the self-publishing formula podcast. Love and that. oh, um, gosh, what they changed their name. It used to be about um, sci-fi and fantasy. And then now, like the six. Oh, so six-figure author. Yes. yes. The broker and, yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, those are my three. Oh, so people in the comments are also saying "write or die." Forgot about that one. That one's a good oh, one. Yes. Okay. I love that one. And yes, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Ellie, hi. There's a call out for a a book, "The Anatomy of Prose" by Sasha Black. Mm -hmm. Sasha is great. Yeah, she, she's got a great book series. I haven't read anything by Sasha Black. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, she's got a book on villains, and um, she's got she's got a lot of a lot of really cool stuff. Hey. Sasha and I work together at the Ally, the Alliance of Independent Authors. So, um, <sighs> got a, got a, that's a nonprofit organization for self published writers. So that's so cool. Yeah, so I had, I had to give her a shout out. Yeah, if you oh, and self publishing with Dale Dale L Roberts. If anyone has never heard of Dale, Dale is a cool dude. He's got a great YouTube channel, and um, he does a podcast as well. And uh, he focuses on helping helping you write, like not helping you write, but helping you know what the publishing options are as a self-published writer. And mm -hmm. he's just got a phenomenal podcast and he's growing really, really fast. He's everywhere. I see him. Yeah, he <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, writing ceases with Braden Sanderson. I, yeah. I like that one and I always forget what that is, which is stupid because I like how they end their podcast. <laughs> now you're out of right. Oh, you're out of excuses. Never right. <laughs> right. Yep. Brandon Sanderson also has his entire like creative writing class. Is uh, on the one that yeah. is at a university. Man, when this year started, I was so excited that he was redoing his lectures pretty much. Because, I mean, not redoing. He obviously has more content and stuff like that. But, yeah, whenever he, he was doing another round of it, I was like, yay, mm -hmm. I already listened to that yeah. twice. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you just, like, search on YouTube, like, Brandon Sanderson creative writing class, it'll pop up. Mm -hmm. it's and then absolutely save that playlist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to come back to it. So yeah. great. I'm also a big fan of if you're wanting to look at story structure, reading books about like screenplay writing, because those they always really break down story to like its bones or whatever. So I've 
the one I've most recently read is like the anatomy of story by John Truby, mm -hmm. um, which has definitely helped me look at story um, deeper than just like a plus B equals C um, kind of looking at like, how can I make all of these pieces come together to make a story that will resonate with people? Um, also like screenplay by Sid Field, you know, the classic. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. I, um, when I first started learning outlining, that was the one that clicked with me. Yeah. Was screenplay and then um, story engineering by Larry Brooks. Oh, that was I heard another that one. one. Yeah, <laughs> right that, I'm reading that's, it now. That, yeah, that's great. That, the, that's when it clicked. That's like, okay, I get it now. Cause I, I was watching movies and I was like, okay, I can like, I watched all the Pixar movies and I saw the Larry Brooks. It was every time it was like beat by beat. It was like, and it was predictable. Mm -hmm. I found the only issue I had with like, with, with that method was that my novels were really short mm -hmm. because like I wanted to hit all of the points and then I would do it, but then I would end up with like a novel that was like 30,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my, my problem when I first started was learning how to flesh everything out. Mm -hmm. And so, that's what I think that just goes back to our earlier point of like studying so many different things and mixing and matching yeah, so that sure. you can grow your story. Mm -hmm. I do find that my drafts tend to be, uh, they're, they're skinny drafts. I, I'm not an overwriter at, at all, me but yeah, me my background is in um, journalism. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so, Cool. So, I'm, writing against I'm like, what? No, I, no, I don't overwrite at all. What are you talking about? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the question, Maddie, is does Brandon Sanderson count as an author too for now? <laughs> Listen, if there would have been any way that he would have came to any of these panels just to say hello. <laughs> I would have died, <laughs> like oh right then and there. For sure. yeah. I think he's busy running that Kickstarter now. So yeah. Oh <laughs> no, actually, he uh, he didn't make the cut for this. Exclusive <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> he really wanted to, but he just he, just he didn't, didn't make it. By his author too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brandon Sanderson <laughs> could possibly be involved in another great writing retreat. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He could message right now and be like, go off air, I'm going on. <laughs> We'd be like, yes, please. Yeah, get there. <laughs> Here's my channel. Do you want to use it? <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. How important is describing the appearance of your characters in stories, face shape, haircut, eye color, skin color, hair color, body type, weight, height, et cetera, et cetera? I am not big on all of these descriptions. Right. I tend to, I, I like to, okay. So with my cozies, um, my, my main characters are black. So I tend to make sure that you know that immediately. And because I want you to recognize that the voice is gonna be a little different perhaps than what you're used to reading in a cozy mystery because the majority of the time with a cozy mystery, the main character is a Caucasian female. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what, so I tend to, I'll talk a little bit about skin color, but I don't dwell on it because that's not the point, but I tend to talk more about hair. <laughs> I talk a lot about hair and then with other people, they'll have something like a thing. So maybe they have um, like my, one of my characters, oh gosh, I love her. She always wears a t-shirt that has some type of really smart alecky and almost risque saying on it. <laughs> so when she comes in, she, you hear about her t-shirt and you know, that's who she is, you know, but how do y'all deal with um, describing your characters? Yeah. I, um, I, I've learned a lot about writing characters over the last couple of years. One of the things that I've learned and I, I've studied a lot of the mega bestsellers and I've had pretty fortunate to have a mentor that's, that's pretty, does pretty well for himself. Um, the more you describe a character, the more readers think that character is important. So if you think about like a main character, your main character is going to get the most of the bandwidth 
of descriptions because they're the main character, right? And then followed by supporting characters, so on and so forth. But if you've got like a walk-on character or a minor character that only appears once in the story, if you ascribe a lot of description on what that character looks like, readers might think that character is important when in all actuality, they're not. So if you actually look at the works of the mega bestsellers, like uh, I saw this in Michael Crichton, John Grisham, Nora Roberts, when they use like the minor characters that only serve one singular purpose, they almost never describe them. Like mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting. Like I, I kept seeing it over and over and over again. They would never describe the minor characters. They might say, oh, this person was an attorney and they had a briefcase. And that's all you get. You don't get anything else. They, they let you fill in right. your, in your head what you think the character looks like. And then they don't do anything that contradicts that. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have a main character, they're going to be a lot more descriptive of what the character looks like. And they're going to be more protective of, of that because they want you to see that in your head. So that would be my answer is I think it's fine to do whatever you want with like a main character or a character is going to be important. But if the character is not important, then you probably want to spend less time on what they actually look like. That's just something I learned over the years. Yeah, that's great. That's really interesting because um, I feel like I have read books in the past where I had thought a main character or a smaller character was going to be so much more. And I think it was because maybe the author um, described them too much. So I expected more. Yep. And then whenever they weren't in it, I was like, oh, that's it with them? Okay. I just like totally built them up in my head now. And now I, there's nothing there. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? So yep. yeah. I, uh, he's the reader. Kind of like unsatisfying almost whenever you don't get that person who now you've pictured where I do like how you had said where um, like Nora Roberts or Michael uh, Crichton uh, would just describe like the briefcase and have it to where it's like they just fill in the gaps from there and stuff. I think that's a really great idea. Yeah. Um, I like Tamara tend to underwrite quite a bit and where I underwrite is in the description. <laughs> and I just know that I know I'm going to do that. I know that I'm going to have to do a pass in my revisions for description. So I don't stress too, too much about how I'm the, describing them in a first draft. But then once I do finish that draft, I know I need to sit down and hammer out like what do all my major characters look like? Because I like in my last round of revisions, I found one chapter where the same character had three different eye colors, the same guy within like three pages. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> His eyes were blue, green, and copper. Just all three. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I like to go through and I have like a little spreadsheet that I use after I've finished up my first draft and I know I'm gonna need to streamline everything and kind of beef up those details where I put what's the character, what's their age, um, eye hair color, height build, other notable features. Um, what do they smell like? Um, you know how everyone has a, a two cent smell scape, you know? Yeah, yeah, true. Um, the, what their favorite everyday outfit is, what they would wear if they wanted to look a little nice. Um, and then if they are like religious, what's their favorite food? Just like all these random details that I could right. like use to beef up how they appear because I like to think they have good personalities, hopefully, but how they look is just like paper dolls at the end of my first draft. Oh, I have the exact opposite problem where like if if I don't rein myself in, I will spend a whole page talking about trees. Like I really need to be careful. And I definitely always in first drafts fall into that um fall into that trap of being like this person's introduced. Here is half a page of what they look like and what they're doing and what like so I really have to be careful with that. But I I kind of honed it a little bit to now if I am introducing somebody or you know new situation I'll focus on a couple of main points. So if it's a character, I'll say, oh, the, this is their hair color and something about them. Maybe like, oh, maybe they're really tall. Maybe they're really muscular. Maybe they are wearing a very, very bright red shirt. And then kind of that's like the, my first kind of like hit. And then uh, as the scene goes on, I'll kind of introduce a little bit more and be like, oh, wow. I, when she turned her head, her nose was a really had a really strong profile or something just to kind of like ease it in because mm -hmm. I just I just like to write descriptions a lot. Yeah. Well, it's kind of it's kind of like when you meet someone for the first time. Yeah, exactly. They give you a first impression, right? Yeah, and like so, you notice a couple of things off the bat and then as exactly. yeah, further in the conversation. 
Yeah, and then I you... find it's like you have to really, sorry, um, I find like you really have to like practice in real life almost. So sometimes when I'll meet a new person, I'll be like, all right, what did I first notice about them? And then kind of make the effort to notice more about them. Like how do they, uh, how is their posture? How, what do they, you know, do they talk with their hands a lot? Uh, like those things. And I find like that helps writing too, because it's a more realistic tick then, oh, this person's leaning against the doorway for a whole scene and not doing anything. Rachel, what um, genre do you write? Mostly fantasy, but I'm dabbling in contemporary with mixed results. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, hmm, she write like literary? Oh, hmm. no, oh God, no, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> No offense. <laughs> no, I don't offense anybody that likes that. Uh, not my cup of tea. That's typically, that's typically what a literary author would say. And, yes. You know, or, or what they would do is, is spend a lot of time talking about tr a, tr a tree or flowers or <laughs> I kind of thought the same thing. So it's kind of interesting to hear you say that. Oh, no, I'm, I'm definitely like a high fantasy person. Um, but that makes sense I, for high fantasy too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. This is interesting. Um, Folks in the comments, they're talking about that they draw out their characters mm -hmm. and use Sims to uh, create the characters so they can see them. That's interesting. Yeah. I've done that before for sure with Sims. <laughs> and I feel like I saw someone else had mentioned uh, using Pinterest to create like mm -hmm. vision boards for characters. Yeah, Barbara said, I grab images from the web as examples of characters. Mm -hmm. Do y'all do anything like that with like drawing characters or looking for uh, outside influences to kind of help you shape what your characters look like? I honestly don't do any of the grabbing pictures from Pinterest type thing to make it to where it's like, oh, that looks like my person. Um, I, I honestly, it's like all in my head. I feel like it's gonna be hard to find the exact image online somewhere, you know what I mean? Um, but also whenever I'm in the first stages of outlining, the only thing I really focus on is mainly hair color and skin color and like how they, if, if they're like a casual dresser or if they're like very fancy or something like that, just to kind of see like what their outside matches of their personality almost type thing. Mm -hmm. Also color, you were like talking about a bright red color, Rachel, or something like that for that person's shirt. Um, I will kind of semi assign a color to someone, like if they mm. like to wear boots or something like that. When in my head, I'll picture it, it's weird. I'll like have in my head blue, like I don't know. It's weird to say, but um, I, like cause sometimes people might be more uh, like a bubbly personality. I might give them in my head. I see like yellow or something like that for the sun or something, and mm -hmm. so. That probably makes no sense. So it's like kind of giving mind. them like a color scheme or a color yeah, palette. I just yeah. kind of like, my, like, like Belle, like uh, she wears like the blues and the yellows. And in my head, when I think of Belle, I usually think of blue or yellow. And so yeah. that's where my colors go to. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> no, it's, that's yeah. cool. I think that's yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. I definitely think a lot of, because I do really love Pinterest and just making the aesthetic or whatever, but I, have no artistic abilities at all. So it's like, it's gotta be Pinterest or it's not happening. <laughs> um, but it is very like, I do have in my head what their faces look like, but I tend to think of their faces in like components. Like this, mm -hmm. is like, this is what their nose looks like. And I have a hard time seeing like, ah, yes, that's that person. So my Pinterest boards, it's a lot of like a person standing a certain way or like their hands. I'm like, that is, those hands are so Kent, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I remember like a long time ago, not a long time ago, like I'm so old, but like I remember uh, for a while when I was addicted to Wattpad and just reading all those stories and how every single person who took uh, like, they would always do celebrity casts and it was always like the same five people over and over again as the main character as this, you know, pretty blonde, blue eyed girl or this like or tall, handsome, dark guy. And I just remember being like, this is not what this person looks like. Like just from reading the first couple chapters, like this is not the same person. So like, what is happening here? Well, it, is so, it is annoying whenever there's like an actor cast type mention. Yeah. Because it's like, nope. 
I did not ever line that up together. At yeah, all. exactly. I'm really like, okay, them. well, they're both tall and have brown hair, but like that's the only similarity. So yeah, yeah I can't go through and be like, oh, this celebrity looks exactly like what I want my character to yeah. look like. Yeah, yeah, I don't tend know. to do that either. That I don't know because I I have like conceptions of the actor, you know, and I mm -hmm. I don't necessarily and if that person's personality or the roles they normally take doesn't work with my character and that's not going to make sense inside of my head so why mm -hmm. even put myself through that kind of cognitive dissonance like, yeah i have enough to anyway <laughs> and if it's supposed to be a romance book and if you describe the uh, guy character like tom middleston if you don't find loki particularly like attractive then that's hard to like you know what I mean? It's hard to like have that be like your hot protag uh, protagonist interest and everything. Uh, let's be love interest and everything yeah. to like, have your mind set on for the rest of the book. I don't know. Well, it's it's also kind of like oh, you have you, there's so many people who are tall and have dark hair and are handsome. Like that doesn't mean anything. That could be a ton of different kinds of faces and and what have you. So it's. I don't know. I'm, I, like Megan said, I like that when you see like, oh, a nice portrait of hands or like you know half of a face or something. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I can get behind that. I like, with this. hand thing. Like, oh, that's so like their hands. I've never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone doesn't think that. I do. I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe that's so also like it shows what you're attracted to, or it shows like no. what you find interesting about people. I will say mm. if it's like an artist who like does clay or something mm. like that, if that's like your thing in their book, then I can totally see like thinking of what their hands would look like because you're thinking about how they would mold things. But mm. <laughs> I just liked that that you shared that. That was, cute. <laughs> that was the thing that came to mind. I'm like pulling out the Pinterest board now. Like, do I yeah. have anything other than hands on it? <laughs> So, it's just hands. It's hands. It's all bones. Bones. just hands. So Tessa says, as a writer who mainly writes short stories, I am not used to describing characters and places much since I am writing such a short piece. I find myself struggling to add these mm -hmm. concepts to my novel. So could we give Tessa any kind of advice on how to, there was other people that were like, how do you, how do you do this as an underwriter? So do we have any advice for the underwriters in the room, such as myself? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a great point, Tessa, because writing short stories is, is almost in many ways a completely different animal than, than writing novels. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a fair number of short stories and that's actually how I got my start. And I, I kind of had the same problem. I, I think, think about it like this. Think about your fiction as mind control. So you want to control what the reader sees in your story. So they're, they're reading your book and they're converting that to an image in their head. What are the things you want them to see? And like you, with your main character, what are the things you'd want them to see with your main character? Because with a short story, you're not gonna have as much bandwidth to do that. So you're not gonna be able to spend as much time on the setting and the characters. But if you could imagine a movie in your reader's heads, what would that look like? And then I think that's a great way to start thinking about, okay, how do I need to start fleshing out what I want the reader to see? Because it, it's easiest with setting, I think. I think setting is the easiest to start fleshing out. But maybe if you think about it like that, maybe that will be of some help to you. Yeah, I've heard it called uh, where you direct the camera. Like yeah, you exactly. Um, you describing that reminded me of Stephen King when he talked about the white bunny or maybe just bunny in like that cage or box thing. And then he had it to where it's like, well, what did you think the bunny was? Was the bunny white? Was the bunny like beige? Or was it like a cage? Yeah. Or was it like a glass box? Or I don't know. I think mm. it's because then it's kind of to like, okay, even though this reader interpreted it like this, it could be interpreted in a different way. So how do you want it to really be? Exactly, exactly. And what you have to be careful of is saying a bunny first, and then on the next page, you say it's a brown bunny, because yeah. then you've just contradicted what, what the reader saw in their head. So you have to be careful of that as well. So like, if, if I say I'm standing next to a barn, I better just not describe the barn for the rest of the story, because otherwise, I'm going to contradict if I start saying it's red, or if I say it's falling down. You kind of want to set the stage first mm -hmm. and then 
because it's all about not contradicting them. Because you, if you want to control their minds, <laughs> I know I can't can't think of any better term. I think someone in the comments said neurospeak. That's maybe a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to control their minds, then you have to make sure you're not contradicting. I love that you had said that about like if you picture a barn is and then you later on you're picturing uh, you're saying how it's falling down whereas in your in the reader's head it's like oh it's like all of a sudden in their head it was this beautiful cute little barn house yeah. and then all of a sudden in an instant it's like just kind of all shabby looking and just like all crumpled and stuff like that I mean and that could have taken several pages for them to go oh okay I need a really rearrange how my mind interpreted this and stuff. So yeah, I do think kind of mentioning the overall aspect of it kind of at the get go is better for keeping that image in their head longer. Yeah, I've definitely read that in books before and then just been like, what to have taken completely <laughs> aback and kind of taken out of the story because you're like, oh, this isn't how, yeah, this wasn't how the movie was going and suddenly it's very different. So like, mm -hmm. yeah. This, uh, were you going to say something, Michael? No, no, I just was agreeing. Okay. Um, this isn't something that I personally do in the outlining phase, but it is something you could do in the outlining phase that I tend to do when I'm revising um, as an underwriter is I will, at the top of the scene that I'm about to work on, I write down who is in this scene, like who all is on the set, where are we, and what do I want people to feel when they read it? Like, what's the mood I want to set? Do I want them to be unsettled? Do I want them to feel like relief because we're taking a breather? And then I try and look at, um, as I'm telling the story from there, well, like, how can I have my character interact with all of these things so that I can get the plot across, but also, you know, the things that they touch, that's an opportunity for you to build the setting and the world. Um, the things that they notice, that's an opportunity for you to build the character because character A is not going to notice the same things as character B. Mm -hmm. um, so really like starting with character and then like trying to build it all out from there is my big goal in trying to beef up my writing. I find too that at this stage in my writing, asking my beta readers to tell me, hey, have I missed something? And mm -hmm. I have definitely had the, you know, um, what 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 does she look like? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I <don't> well, know. <laughs> if she looks like da da, da 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 da. I guess I didn't mention any of this. I should probably throw you a bone. <laughs> so you have some idea of who you're talking to. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's add that in. So oh. that's kind of because again, I underwrite so. I tend to really err on the side of giving, like, I try to give a little bit of description, but I think that, you know, sometimes I fall short. So my betas and my critique par partners tend to reel me in mm -hmm. and let me know that I have missed the mark sometimes. And Which you made such a great point, Megan, about characters seeing things differently. Like if you've got a, two characters in the same scene, if they see it the same way, you're probably doing something wrong, you know, unless they have, you know, some neural link where they can mm -hmm. share, share thoughts, but like, yeah, they're always going to respond differently and they're going to, they're going to see it differently and smell it differently and have different opinions about what might be happening. One of the most, I, there was a mentor that gave me an exercise and I had to describe a scene through the, through the eyes of one character and then through the eyes of another character, exact same, circumstances and it was really eye-opening for me mm -hmm. that sounds like a fun exercise mm -hmm. like yeah. hmm, you should do that sometime yeah yeah so okay. folks ask your questions and please put a question at the front so i could find it help me help you yeah because i don't really have that many questions oh. left because we've kind of yeah, actually, um, in the vein of that, uh, <laughs> I was like, "What happened? We're different now." Where did she go? And I just like, and it just went back and freaked me out for a little bit. Okay, we're good. Everything's fine. Yeah, we rearranged. It was kind of like the Brady. Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let's look at the heads now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had to have one technical malfunction. Of course, this was it. Everything's going to be fine from now on. <laughs> Everything's uh, coming up Millhouse. 
Yeah. Um, oh, big recommend for Marie Lu's Legend trilogy. Um, it's got two main characters, Day and June, who are from drastically different backgrounds. And that was one of the first books that I ever remember reading with a critical eye and being like, oh, wow, she did a really good job of like having the characters' voices be really distinct. Um, they, there's no way they're going to enter the room. They're not even going to open the door the same way. Um, and it's just really great. That's cool. Ooh, if I can recommend one that's uh, a little bit more recent, but it's House of Dragons by Jessica Cluis. Um, mm -hmm. And she has a cast of five characters. And at first I was a little bit like, oh, I don't know. But every person's voice is so distinct. You can absolutely tell when chapters change. I loved seeing all the different perspectives, especially because they're all quite very different characters. Uh, I thought that was one of the best hem like casts that I've read in a, a long time. So I highly recommend that one. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So my last question that I already had set up is what's your preferred software for drafting or outlining? Just what software do you, do you tend to, uh, you know, tend to go to, you go to steps? Mine is Google Docs because um, there, I had Scrivener for a bit and it was way too organizing for me, who is not a type A person. I'm very just like whatever type thing. And so Google Docs is just a way of being able to work with my stuff at home or at work. If I had some downtime at work, then I'd be able to pull that up. Because there for the longest time, I just kept going, ah, I hate having to have Scrivener at home and then having the right stuff at work, email it to me later on and then try and make it all go and be cohesive later on in Scrivener. Um, but I just always uh, do it through Google Docs that way. But yeah, I'm just really plain and boring with that. <laughs> Scrivener's a more high, high gear than I need. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brooke, what kind of phone do you have? Um, an Android or phone, iPhone? Um, it's, an, it's an iPhone. Okay. Have you have you considered Scrivener iOS? Um, I didn't know that they really had an app on a phone. It's kind it's of fantastic. New. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very good. good. Um, now, Google Docs is cool because you can access it anywhere. Yeah, I've done that on my phone with Google Docs before. So that's, yeah. But yeah, I never knew that they had Scrivener on there. I still don't really care for it. It's like if I do a quick note on my yeah. phone, then that's good. But like. Yeah, writing with your thumbs is not for everybody. Yeah, no. Yeah. I've never It's very interesting. I, uh, I was a really big Scrivener fan, but I, I operate off of Windows, and they have not come out with an update for Windows yeah. in How a dare dare they? lifetimes. <laughs> which, again, it's, it's so complicated. <laughs> but <laughs> so I do Google Docs now as well, because I do like that I can just have it all the time. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I outline with... Uh, notebook and note cards. Um, and I have a, an ideas note on my phone that I'll like throw stuff into, but if I'm gonna sit down and outline, it's gonna be on note cards and with just a plain old notebook. I am absolutely a notebook person. I take a lot of notes in my notepads. That's why I'm at pen paper pad almost everywhere. <laughs> so like, this is, um, the notes that I was taking for um, Midnight Murder, which is a, a uh, newsletter magnet that I'm gonna be releasing very soon. Very, very soon, super promise. But um, I also use Scrivener and for sharing docs with, um, with my betas and my critique partners, I use Google Docs because it's just, it's just simpler. It's so much simpler yeah. to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, I'll use Word, but I don't like to use Word for the entire document because I was having so much trouble just with my laptop. And I don't know if it was just this Word itself, but I would have issues with Word not really enjoying having a big document mm -hmm. and I would have yeah. issues with it. So I was like, all right, I will do like, if I need to do like a little scene tweak or something like that, or if, my um my editor prefers using words, so that'll be like my last thing. I'm like, oh god, here we go. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, that is a downside to Google Docs too, is that like once you get over 80k, it it 
does it's not rough. happen anymore. <laughs> it starts to really lag. Yeah, yeah it's true. Ah, dictation. Mm -hmm. yeah, Google Keep. Yep, Google I've, Keep. I have not I used Google Keep. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, I didn't know what Google Keep. I, um, I did dictation for my Google Docs on my phone. Um, yeah. I didn't yeah. know Google Google Keep is kind of like Evernote, if I remember correctly. Ah, oh, okay. Um, where it, you can you can have notes and recipes and things like that. So. <laughs> oh, I use um, Dragon also mm -hmm. for dictation. Yep. Uh, I know a fellow word nerd Kelly like loves Dragon Speak. Mm -hmm. I I really enjoy it, especially when my wrists are angry at me. <laughs> it's a good yeah. way to like give them a rest. I yeah, Dragon is great. It, it's just not really good for Mac. That's the only thing. That yeah. The Mac, I, it used to work really well, and then it, it just stopped supporting it. It's kind I feel of, like oh, yeah, I think they stopped um, updating it or something, or some something that wasn't a good business idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, who am I? I don't know anything about anything. Um, I haven't used Dabble either. Have any of you used Dabble? No. I've been writing down so many programs. <laughs> I was going to say that to Mary. Have you dabbled in Dabble? Oh, no, yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to check that out. That's interesting. I've never heard of it. I do like that name. <laughs> I do as well. Let's see. How many projects are you working on at one time? Oh, oh, oh dear. Question. More than I should be. <laughs> I want to know Michael's answer because you've written a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, you know, I usually work on one book at a time, mm -hmm. and then I'm usually working on other things. Like I, I like right now, I'm working on a course, so I'm doing a course and a book, and then I've got all my content. Like I have a YouTube channel, and then I've got like three podcasts. So I try to just do one thing at a time because if I don't, then I just get too scattered. <laughs> Do your days have more hours than mine? Because like, right. what is happening? Like, wow. It's all about efficiency. I, I automate a lot of stuff and mm. you know, I, 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 awesome. do, I do have some help, you know, part-time assistance and stuff that I can bring on. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it, it's, 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 it's always a challenge. Here, here's a question. Michael, do you watch TV? Because I, I do like not watch TV. I was about mm -hmm. to say, I bet you do not watch TV because it sounds like <laughs> everything and that's, Probably the magic. Yeah, right? writing is, is pretty much everything I do. Um, I, I I gave up television. I gave up video games. I gave up music, like being a musician. Um, I I was just kind of all into this. That's so, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. What am I working on right now? Um, I just finished doing the edits for this. Um, story for a cozy mystery box set um mystery follows her that will be available on the 25th i feel like that is correct um and i have i'm doing the follow-up to wiped out and i need to finish the okay so i do more than <laughs> one at it now that you're talking, this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, a couple you know, things. I that, okay, yeah, I, I see. I see what I'm doing here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Usually, I have one main focus project, and then I'll have another one kind of in the background on the back burner. That's just like, just in case I really don't want to work on this new one, or like I just need a break or something. I'm like, oh, you know, a couple words there, and then back to the main project. So usually two. They're like. Yeah. Every once in a while, there's three, but that we don't talk about that. That's very <laughs> rare. <laughs> yeah, I am a little similar. I like to have something to work on that's at all the different stages. So, like, I'll have one that I'm revising and one that I'm drafting pretty frequently because then it's like, like I love to write every day. I don't necessarily feel like you have to, but if I have like that thing that I'm revising and then that thing that I'm drafting, then I'm more likely to be getting more done because it's like, oh, well, I don't feel like writing. I could revise or if I don't feel like revising I can draft and then there's always like that little thing that's way on the farthest back that's like this is kind of an idea I'm just taking notes on this every now and then <laughs> yeah I, feel I like oh. oh go ahead I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. I feel like since I work full-time I have to just focus on one project um otherwise 
there will be no progression. <laughs> um, I will, however, always have a series or book that's outside of the book or world that I am currently working on. There will always be one in my head that I will plot just in my head. I won't do anything to yeah. like really be working on, but there will always be the thoughts of that one that just linger and haunt me and stuff where I'm like, okay, this is noted for later. It's in that file cabinet in my head for later type thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, it's Mary. Go ahead. Oh no. It it was absolutely fine. And I can't remember what I was going to say, but that is not a big deal. I have the memory of a goldfish. So someone <laughs> mentioned um, Noveler oh. and I am unfamiliar with this one. I, I know I've seen this name before, but I've never used it. I've seen the name too, but I don't know what it is, but I've seen that because I've always thought that's misspelled. <laughs> There's a lot the of them that are. Yeah. <laughs> Tumblr, Scrivener, Noveler, you're like all these I saw like, someone oh. recommend Potter yeah. and the E was <laughs> What, 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 is, with what is with the vowels? <laughs> like, I'm writing down vowels. some of these so I can yeah. look at them after the fact. Yeah, same. <laughs> Um, side note, hashtag writing community. The one that normally pops up is misspelled. <laughs> Just oh. a side note on Twitter, where I live in the dumpster fire. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Looking for some questions. If someone asks, what is Dabbler? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love like finding out all these new things that people are talking about where I'm just like, ooh, interesting. Yeah, this ooh. is great. I know what I'm doing for the rest of my afternoon. Like, <laughs> oh, Noveler is a competitor for Scrooge. Ah. That is interesting. Both and of the birds. Yes. I'm actually on their website right now. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you get stuck during the outlining process? I can't really answer that. <laughs> I ask what if, that's always a good one because that way you can kind of plot as many like branches, I guess, as you want because it's okay, well, you're stuck here. What if this thing happens versus if, what if this thing happens? And then you can kind of just like work your way down and be like, oh, this actually leads to maybe an ending. Whereas this one is like, we're not gonna, you know, scrap that one. And that always is the, I mean, you could also will be like, how could everything go wrong? <laughs> and, then, and then right from there. <laughs> what else could go wrong? And yeah, exactly. Solution of what you're needing. Uh, yeah. As a reader, when like everything starts going wrong, I'm like, can we please, just please know and something else goes wrong. I'm like, oh God. Uh, like, <laughs> and the author's like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, I love it, but I hate it, but I love it, so. Yeah, that's one of the most important questions I think you can ask. It it works at any any at any point in your process is what if. Mm -hmm. It just gets the mind going and I mean, yeah. yeah, that's really like the beginning question, uh, isn't it? You know, just what's oh. the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. What's the worst thing that could happen? I think isn't it to where it's like have it be where it's uh, anything that's inconvenient for your character, not things that are convenient for your character. Mm -hmm. like, have mm -hmm. different solutions, like be solved or something like that. Have mm -hmm. more conveniences than like, oh, well, that was that was very easy for them. <laughs> or yeah. yeah. Right. What well, I'm was like, like too convenient. Yeah, but then you're expecting something to go wrong right after if anything is too convenient. <laughs> so. I was going to say um, one of the things that I do when I when or when I outlined was backtrack a little bit because maybe a decision that you made two or three scenes ago was not the right decision. Mm -hmm. and so if you backtrack a little bit, you can maybe see where you went wrong. Maybe you went down the wrong path and you just mm -hmm. need to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually yeah. going to say something really similar of uh, a lot of times when I'm stuck, one of the most useful things I can do is like stop trying to force it. Don't try to push forward and try and diagnose like, well, what's the problem? Because sometimes the problem is as simple as like, you're working full time, you just need to take a day off. Yeah. Um, and then like drink some water, eat some real food, and then go outside. Yes, go outside. <laughs> and sometimes the problem is like you said, it's in the story itself, you need to fix something before you can move ahead. Um, or you need to just take a note and be like, Oh, when I revised two scenes ago, that's the new thing that's happening. Let me keep going now. Um, 
that's kind of what I think about with dealing with writer's block. That's kind of my approach. You know, what's happening right now? Am I super stressed? How can I mitigate whatever's happening? Or is, is there a problem within the story? Have I taken a wrong turn? And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. how, how do you all focus on writer's block? If I could ask, this is probably a really question. good question to tackle for the audience. I like to write, so, like the, I never like to write things out for outlining. I don't use journals or notebooks or anything like that. And still I do have writer's block. I usually have to write it out by hand. I can type it out if I have to type out like idea number two or idea number three for like how to solve this or something like that. But usually by hand, it's what's really the golden ticket for me to, I don't know why, it's just it's easier to get out of a rut whenever I'm hand writing out different scenarios or something. Mm -hmm. But that's just me. That's the only time of where I like actually write on paper anymore. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like there's a different connection with the pen than with the typing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. At least for me. Is that the same with you guys in the comments? Let us know. Interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like you have to have the old school writer in you before you knew how to type and stuff. You have to have that help you out. Yeah. yeah. I also I love the whiteboards. I have two right there and I have a giant one in my closet because I love if I'm feeling stuck and I know it's a story problem that like no, it's something I need to adjust in the story. I'll pull out my biggest whiteboard and I'll write down like three different things. Okay, if I change this thing and or this thing or this thing, and then I'll just write all of the thens beneath it. Hmm. And usually that helps me figure out like, uh, I like this. This is the, the cool thing to do. <laughs> I find having writing friends really helps or even yeah. just, yeah, even like somebody who is not only necessarily a writer, but like someone who's completely outside of y your own little bubble, just like bounce some ideas off of, because that sometimes even when you're like saying it out loud to somebody, it can really help kind of like get everything turning again. And as somebody who is like also works full time is in school, English student, writes a lot of essays. Sometimes I get so focused on like the academic side that I'm like, how do I write something that is not like an essay structure? What is fantasy writing anymore? I don't know. I've been writing about like 18th century English poets for two months and like what is happening anymore? And so sometimes having that like little extra back and forth can really like, mm -hmm. you know, re revive something in there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to make that switch, especially with academic stuff, right? Because it's mm -hmm. so right brained or is it right brain or left brain? I don't remember from your remember. Uh, it, it's inside right. of the brain that's more brain. logistical or logical. Yes. <laughs> logistical, but logical. Technically your left brain is like the artsy one, but also technically that's like half pseudoscience. It's yeah, half I don't sort know of that, that's what I mean. anymore, but I, I, it's always, always, always how I thought about it. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I really admire y'all being able to um, like do the school thing and also write drafts. I, when I was studying full time, I was not able to do it. I tried so hard, but I was like, I can't, my brain isn't able to function on this level. So kudos to you. My well, goodness. like sometimes it's, you know, a couple words. Sometimes it's a couple, like it's a chapter. Sometimes it's like a couple words, Yeah. <laughs> which is why I'm like, oh, deadlines. I only know those if it's for this class that I'm taking. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. With, with writer's block for me, I've always found that I try to figure out where the block is coming from. Like, is it, is it from like this internal fear that I have that the story's not going to be good enough? Is it because I'm not inspired or motivated or is it because maybe there's something else in my life, like a test or an exam, like that I need to be doing and handling that my subconscious is stopping me from mm -hmm. writing the story. I feel like if I can figure out where the block is coming from, it makes it so much easier to align myself with. It's it's kind of like when you're swerving, like I live in Iowa, so we have a lot of snow. And if you're swerving, like if your car goes out of control, you're supposed to lean into the swerve rather mm -hmm. than try to overcorrect. It's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Like just, just try to lean into it. Yeah. Um, one of the things I also like about uh, having writing friends to bounce things off of is that they will not, I don't know if we're allowed to, they will not BS you. <laughs> um, they will tell you if like you are just procrastinating or if you're just afraid, they'll be like, shut up, you're being afraid, just go and write. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I can't, I can look in the mirror a lot and be like, come on, just do it. But having them be like, no, go and do it. You are, you're scared or you just need to get through it. 
is really helpful. <laughs> Yep. I definitely, there's times when I definitely want to talk to my, my writer friends, but there's other times when like my fiance, it, I call him the math magician and he's working on a doctorate in math. He is not a writer at all. <laughs> like 200%. No, thank you. I, on the other hand, I'm very bad at math. That's why I said 200%. Anyway, so, <laughs> I'll, so he's sitting on the couch and I'm like, Hey, can I tell you about my story? And he's, He'll drag himself away from other, whatever game he's playing. Okay, just lay it on me. And then I'll just, just so that I can speak out loud and kind of hear what I'm saying and so I can process it in a different way. And a lot of times I'll stop in the middle of a sentence. I'm like, okay, thanks. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> but, this is happen to help. All right. Yeah. yeah he's like, I'm here. Cool. <laughs> But it's really, it really helps me out just to have, it's, just to have that like outward speaking thing happening. Isn't that the same thing in coding where they say like talk to a rubber, a rubber duck or like you put like a little toy next to your computer and if you don't know what you're doing, speak it out loud to the duck and then that will like help you process it differently. One of the authors that comes to my streams often has a rubber ducky and oh gosh, she gave him a name during one of our streams. Uh, someone help me out. I can't remember. <laughs> we were like, Ducky, wait a second. Ducky this, needs a name. This really makes me want to start talking things out with my dragon now. Oh, <laughs> I love him. Becca C. Smith gave this to me. I love Aww. him. That's <laughs> cool. Because I, love I, She's I, so sweet. I told her, I was like, he, his color of his, scales or whatever you want to say he is um reminds me of Hedwig and so I was like yeah and so I somehow like made that connection so anyway I so now that you're like mentioned that whenever you said that I was like oh, I'm gonna talk Wiggy next time yeah. I have things about this. I'm like so I'm happy to help sorry that is so, so cute a new thing that I will do now oh Wiggy so you have a question here. Has anyone struggled with outlining slash drafting because you're thinking of what others would think of what you write? Not like criticisms, but like, wow, did not know you think that way. <laughs> I feel like this is Megan in a nutshell because <laughs> Megan is like so sweet and fun and like, yeah, we're just like hanging out. And then all of a sudden her writing is just like blood, gore, horror, <laughs> all this dark stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, this is not. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of draft and write with the understanding that my family and stuff are going to be like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of just lean into it at this point. I think I really like when authors will go there, you know, because a lot of, and this is also maybe like the stuff that I read, um, which is predominantly fantasy and like young adult and young adult fantasy. So like the audience there is, you know, a slightly younger, um, but even for higher fantasy, when authors will go there, be it with like maybe some more taboo topics or like violence or like mental illness or something. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Like this is something that I'm willing to, you know, be brought along with on the ride. So I happen to like when people really go for it. Um, I, but you also have to consider what your audience is. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I, um, I, I, that's one of the reasons I write under a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, most of my family they don't read any of my stuff that I that I that I write, and um, so I, I kind of just have a free reign to kind of do whatever I want. And my readers just kind of know you never know you never you never quite gonna know what's gonna show up in one of my books. Mm -hmm. It makes it more fun. You're very it's more like you're an unpredictable person that way. That makes things more interesting. Exactly. <laughs> I Mystery do very wrapped like, in an enigma. Yes, yes, exactly. I do feel like I'm on the same page with Megan a little bit because I am just like blah a lot. And I, for some reason, I always have a fascination with like either paranormal or supernatural death things for some reason. I don't know why. I like to have lots of uh, kind of the same type of thing where it's kind of scariness here and there, kind of creepy vibes um, that I want to try and make my people like unsettled as they're reading and i don't know why i'm like that but i i want to have that have that <laughs> yeah. yeah i wrote my, my last novel was about a necromancer so I think if, uh, people, 
if I if I t- if I tell it to people, they're like, "What the heck?" <laughs> you know, there's always an element of necromancy in like everything I write. Yeah, that's like that's like one of those. Okay, you're really going there. That's yeah. out there. Yeah, for some people, I feel like some people they'd be like, "Ew," or some people would be like, "Give me." <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, you've got to find your people. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, it's, it's like if people say like, "Oh, I'm I'm writing a book," it's usually like. Oh, what are you writing? Are you writing like a fun contemporary about you know some people's lives, or like, oh, are you writing a book about a you know businessman or something? You're like, no, I'm writing something about dark magic and necromancy. They're like, oh, okay, oh. that interesting, yeah, wow. <laughs> but I, yeah. I mean, a lot of people love it. So yeah, I was much more concerned with um, my family reading my poetry than my fiction, mm-hmm. really, because yeah, because that was a lot more personal, right? And it was a lot more of me opening up in a way that I normally don't. So, but with fiction, I'm like, hey, get what you get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is that kind of, like, I know. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I found this also with like vlogging, but also with writing and de- like depending on what you put out into the world, especially when it comes to poetry or maybe a book that has a lot of um, connections with, with you. Where it is that weird thing of like, it's such a large audience that you're kind of putting it out into the world and you're being very vulnerable to a lot of people, but you don't know them. So it doesn't really matter. But as soon as you have someone close to you, yeah. you're like, I saw this poem that you wrote about mental illness. You're like, oh, uh, I'm fine. What are you talking? No, everything's all right. Literally had that happen. Don't, my look, brother was don't like, look at that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> my yeah. brother picked out one of my poems and was like, hey. Uh, you know, it was like, is this about this thing? And I was like, I, can we not talk about this ever, please? Yeah. I don't yeah. I'm okay to, with like thanks. anybody else. I'm okay with everybody else across the world reading it, but like not yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, also, who gave like you that. this? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I used to do Instagram posts of where I'm talking about writing here and there. And I don't care talking about it with complete strangers because it's like, ooh, yeah, I want to talk with people who are doing the same sort of thing as me. And then whenever I go out with some friends and if I see someone I hadn't seen in a while, they're like, oh my gosh, how's your writing? I'm like, you knew about this? About- <laughs> yeah. like, who told? Oh yeah, my God. Exactly. Like, 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 dolls are up for some reason. I don't yeah. know why we're like that, but it just totally mm-hmm. happens. Uh, to where it's like, I don't want to do this now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and you do, you have to kind of decide like, how much of that am I willing to put up with? Because no matter what you do, even if you're like super aware and you adjust a ton, you, someone's gonna look at that and be like, is that me? Did you make them oh, annoying? Yeah. 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 Sure. So if you don't wanna deal with that, maybe use a pen name and then you don't have to tell people and they don't have to think about it ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that's the worst when someone thinks that you're writing about them and you're absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. here it says that they had red hair and I have red hair, so obviously that means it's me. And I'm like, no. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's worse when they get offended over it. Like it's yeah, like, they're really annoying. So like, like am I annoying? You, 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 you know? <laughs> yeah, my I bet you think this song. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My current work in progress is. Um, it's the first horror that I've written like in the real world and not a fantasy world. And it has these three siblings and there's two girls and a boy and I have two siblings, a girl and a boy. <laughs> and um, it's been like super personal in a lot of ways. And then there are definitely times where I'm like, oh no, like if I publish this, I want them to read it because it is like a love letter to them in a lot of ways, but I don't want them to think that all the things the characters are doing are things that I think they would do because they aren't us, but like, so it's a strange line to walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, like that weird being inspired by or yes. completely copying and putting someone into the exactly it's weird. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. I feel like even if you do heavily base a character off of someone you know, by the time that the book is done and edited, they're going to be completely different anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, Catrice, I feel like we may have answered this in the beginning when we were discussing the drafting process more, but I'm not sure. Um, so I'm going to check in with my panelists. Did we, did we hit this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I could add a little bit more to this. Um, I used to not think I had the outline because in my head, I had the kind of lots of the plotting things that you typically do have in mind for a story, I already had those in my head, 
But like how it always is whenever you're trying to write a novel, putting this to paper or screen is so much harder than you realize. So just because you think, or at least this is for my case, just because I think that I have things plotted out my head, whenever you're putting it down on paper, it's like a completely different type of creature <laughs> to where it's, I do feel like I have to outline it all. So whenever I first started being more writerly uh, and getting more serious about it, I just thought, oh, I don't need to outline. Uh, I know people say it's helpful, but I, I already know what I'm doing. But whenever you're putting it all together, it's just so much more of a daunting task to where that's why I now am more outlining and stuff, so. Hmm. Like when I first started writing, I, the teachers and the mentors and people that I worked with, the, those people were very much so like, you need to have an outline, you need to have everything plotted, you need to make sure that you hit beat by beat. You know, this is the rising action. What is falling under the the climax of the story? Who's got, like, it was so formulaic. And so that, like, I was, it was really difficult to write for me for a long time. And then kind of as it went onward, I was like, oh, I don't actually need to do this. This is just what you are wanting me to do, but I don't have to. And so now I'm kind of a little bit of like a pantser and plot. Is, is it an astronaut that's in the middle? <laughs> yeah. I think that's what we call it. That's what we call it on the word nerds. <laughs> yeah. Because you're tethered to the space station, but you're kind of floating. Ah, <laughs> uh, got it. That's I love that. Cool. <laughs> that's funny. It's I'm creative. an astronaut. <laughs> Rachel, I do think what you had just explained kind of relates back to something Michael had said earlier, where sometimes things that you might hear about that is a good idea to try and do, it might not be ready for you at that time. You might have to discover that and actually accept, maybe I should be doing that later on as you get more experience and more uh, of this whole writing a book process under your belt type thing. It's like you don't accept something until you're like, okay, maybe now that I've gone further down this road, maybe I could see myself doing it and then actually give it a try and see how it goes. Yeah, I definitely have a couple of more higher concept things and I'm like, ooh, that would be really cool. But right now I would slander it. So I'm just like, we're gonna put this on the back burner and add to it and maybe one day I'll write it, but not right now. Yeah. yeah. So Jeannie wanted to ask Michael, because everyone's very curious about your process. Do you draft slash outline more than one book at a time? No. Um, when I start writing, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, I start with a basic idea of, of what I what I think the first scene or the first line will be. And I just go from there and I, I, I completely write my stories into the dark. So I have glimmers every, every once in a while of, of what I think will happen. Like if I'm at the beginning of the story, okay, I, I think I can see the character going to, to do this, but I really don't know. And when I finish book one of a series, I especially don't know how book two is gonna start. So I just completely, in, it's the analogy writing into the dark, right? You're literally in a cave and you don't know where you're going. All, all, all you can see is just the very, very dim light in front of your face. Um, and so that's how I've learned how to do stuff. And um, it's not for the faint of heart. It, it is a challenge. But if you can learn how to do it, it's it's really cool because the whole concept is if you don't know where your story's going, then your readers aren't going to know. And that's kind of a fun, fun thing for them, you know. I do enjoy that you used to be more outliner and now you're more into right into the dark type person. I feel like it's so opposite than how normal people are. Cause I mean, I'm, we kind yeah. of flip floppy situation where I went this way and started off this way and you started off this way, but went off this way. It's yeah. kind of how that was a different circumstance for you. Yeah. It was all about efficiency for me. So like when I wrote one of my books, I actually, it was back in 2015, I actually sat down and I had a little timer on my computer and I started the timer every time I worked on the book. So I got a very to the minute accurate account for how long it took me to outline, how long it took me to write, first draft, second draft, third draft, whatever, how long it took me to edit, first revision, second revision. And I, I put it all up on a, on a graph. And I noticed that I spent, it was like 25, 30% of my time outlining but then I noticed that I was I was deviating from my outline every time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, I'm spending 30 percent of my time outlining and only to not use the outline. So what if I got rid of outlining? I would improve my efficiency by 30 mm -hmm. percent. I would be able to write a novel that I was happy with 
And, you know, I want to, I want to write the best books that I possibly can in the smallest amount of time. I don't want to cut corners, but I want to write the best book that I can. And so ultimately that's what it boiled down to for me. Mm -hmm. That's very awesome. Yeah. Like I, I would think of character sheets and how everybody is always like, oh, make sure you have all your character sheets and you yep. know exactly this, everything about them. But like, that's such a time suck that sometimes only really semi helps. So true. Yeah. Three months later, you got a character. Yeah, right. <laughs> one character. Yeah, yeah. One character. Exactly. And then you start writing them and they don't want to do any of the things that you decided yeah. they were going to do. And then like, you're like, oh, all right. <laughs> So we don't have a lot of time left. So let's hit this question from Sincereness. Do you ever give up on a story in the drafting stage? And do you ever think about going back to it? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. I literally just did that this month. <laughs> I, um, when I was drafting Blood Roses and Honeysuckles, I... I drafted on that for years. Like it was a story that I would come to and I would leave it alone and come back to it and leave it alone because I had that issue of, I, I love this story. The story is amazing. However, I feel like I'm not at the right place to actually write this story. And finally, I feel like I finally got there that I had enough I don't know if it was enough writing experience, but enough something that I was like, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to take on this thing. I could do this now. So mm -hmm. I tend to, if I, if I stop writing on a draft, I do tend to go back to it, but it's because I like, I like the end. <laughs> I like being able to like, be like, okay, I finished this draft. I did it. I don't like to leave loose, a lot of loose uh, endings and stuff. Yeah, I know for me, I tend to, if I'm like stopping, stopping a draft rather than like, oh, I've accidentally not written for a couple weeks because I was busy or whatever, you know. Um, but if I've literally said like, no, this isn't working or I am just not feeling it and I put it to the side, I don't typically come back to it because for me to put it aside like that, uh, and this is totally like my process, what works for you, works for you, you know, all of that. Um, for me, I usually only put it aside if there's a fatal flaw. Um, but I do cannibalize the story later because there's always things I love and I want to keep all the things that I love. And so I'll take, you know, those characters or that ending that I loved and I'll bring it into something mm -hmm. that I think is stronger and doesn't have that thing that it's like, oh, I turns out I hate this or this just isn't going to work the way I thought it was. Hmm. And just follow your gut. You know, it, a lot of people tend to abandon stories too soon. And there's something to be said about sticking with it and being proud of, of what you've accomplished. Um, that said, if you feel constant friction every single day and it's an impossible story to write and you just, you don't enjoy it, then you know maybe it is time to abandon it. Mm -hmm. I had started out uh, Camp NaNoWriMo where in my head I had this one fantasy series that I was going to write. And then um, as I was getting a roadblock for it and I was trying to do kind of like what I was talking about earlier, writing stuff out, trying to get my uh, uh, creativity back with that story, I stumbled upon another idea for something else that I was like, oh, that'd be a fun series to write. And then the more I was trying to focus on the original fantasy I was working on, the more fun I started to really feel like I was having for this brand new uh, shiny idea to where it, that eventually took over. And so now that's the one I'm doing. And I know eventually I'll go back to this one fantasy uh, series later, but it was like my love just like overwhelmed me for this other one to where I was like, yep, that's it. There we go. Here we are. <laughs> so that's the new thing I'm focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of self-publishing, Brooke, when you jump into yes. it, you can, it's a choose your own adventure. You can mm -hmm. do whatever you want. And that's, oh, that's choose part your own adventure. <laughs> well, like, you you want to write something that you're excited about and like happy yeah. to write. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it's easy, but mm -hmm. it means you enjoy the work of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Oh my goodness. Well, 
yesterday we were talking about filling the well and I feel like being on this panel filled my well today. You guys have been amazing. But we are at the top of the hour, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So let's do our outros so the folks can have their chance to take a break and stand up and stretch and move around. Because next we have da -da -da -da, Discovery Writing with Robert Jones from the story Detective. So let's start with Rachel Worker Ring Round. Back up to me. Oh, yes. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. It was really nice. My name is Rachel. I'm one of the word nerds along with Megan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have my own channel, which is A Model Who's Red, R E A D. Uh, for uh, puns, puns. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can catch, uh, catch our videos every Tuesdays and Thursdays. All right. Well, oh, oh okay. Awesome. Like sorry. okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just constant. Yeah. <laughs> I also like how your cat was ginger too. Sorry, I was just gonna. Yeah, thank you, oh, thank cool. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, chose, I chose her on purpose. <laughs> I like to hold a cord with my pets. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I'll, go ahead, Michael. It's a, I'll go next, so we can go up. Um, my, uh, you can find me at offlup.com. Um, it's been a pleasure being here. I've really enjoyed the comments. I've enjoyed learning from all of you on the panel. And uh, allthelevelup.com is where you can uh, find my YouTube channel, all the books I have for writers, and all the other resources that I have out there. So it's been a pleasure. Well, um, yeah, my name is Brooke, and I'm uh, from the channel By the Brook, where I go over lots of writing life type stuff uh, with uh, different writing blogs or just writing content or whatever. And I also like to do writing sprints, too. So, yeah, it, it's just been a fun ride uh, today, just kind of getting the chat with everybody. So this was a great uh, way to learn more from other people. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, and uh, I'm Megan. I'm from The Word Nerds, just like Rachel. We talk about books and writing, and uh, we do the virtual write-ins as well, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Sundays. Um, you can find us on wordnerdsvlog, V-L-O-G dot com. Um, so definitely uh, check that out, I guess. Self-promo. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so, so much uh, for having me and for being amazing in the comments. I love all of you. <laughs> yes, what a, like, thank you all. So many comments, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, my name is Tamara Woods. This is my channel where I talk about books and writing. I'm a cozy mystery author. You can find my links down in the description as well as these wonderful people. And let me tell you what, you guys, they have a lot of resources for you. If you haven't visited them before, you absolutely should. I do live streams on my channel every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. It happens. I would love to see you there. In addition, um, at the end of every month, I have what is called Writer's Workshop. That's where we have a nonfiction writing book and we discuss it. Last month, we tore a book apart. This month, we're taking a break because last month's book was awful. And, you know, we we were planning this thing and it was just an, enough. But yeah, last, last month's book, I literally said, don't buy it. <laughs> oh, no. And I've never, ever done that before. I'm going to have to go watch that. Are we allowed to ask what book that was? Uh, you have to look forward to find out but i was livid we were all angry oh uh, my gosh so yeah so uh, but we'll be back at that again next month and i have a patreon if you'd like to support all these things that i enjoy doing that would be absolutely fantastic and again thank you for being here and we're going to see you over in discovery writing workshop have a good one y'all bye, bye. bye. bye.